from our last session, um, we were covering special topics that had to do with encryption and hashing and the SAM, the security account management scenario. And we mentioned that preemptive or preventive forensics makes use of dictionary attacks, bloom filters, and rainbow tables. Now, rainbow tables would be appropriate for larger organizations if you have several petabytes. That's right, I said petabytes of disk array. You can pre-calculate the hashes of uh, 14, 15 character. There's a tipping point. So you can, you can pre-calculate the hashes of random characters in a series and then store them in a large database table. And you can take up to 12 or 13 characters for the length of a password and it will consume uh, very many hundreds of gigabytes, no, hundreds of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, my bad, hundreds of terabytes. And in extreme cases, the higher and higher you go, petabytes. Now there's a tipping point when you get to 15 characters. And this is a well-known phenomenon among system engineers. And in fact, uh, this is a recommendation in training boot camps for the system engineering certification. They'll tell you privileged accounts should use 15 or more characters for a password because the size of the rainbow table you'd have to have could only be achieved by like very wealthy organized crime syndicates, international crime syndicates, you know, fortune 100 companies or, you know, uh, nation states, right? So it would take, it would take the resources of an entire nation. Now I will say this, I am confident that the Chinese army, I'm talking about the red Chinese army, they have rainbow tables that take it out uh, much further than that. So if they can get a hold of a hash inside that's stored inside where, well, if it's a, if it's a local, if it's a local security account management model, if it's a work group, the hash is stored locally on the system. So if they're on the system, they can get at the hash, then they run it through their rainbow table. Um, it's possible that even smaller governments could have rainbow tables though. So if you were working for criminal justice in a criminal forensic capacity, it's, it's not out of range with advances in storage technology for um, you know, a territory or a state to have a criminal investigation division for the state or the territory, and then uh, they have these tables. That's a fascinating, that is a fascinating topic to examine. And I think it would be actually a really cool topic for like a summer research project, because I think we have enough disk space on hand to like work a smaller pilot to see how effective it is and and, and how uh, that works. The state of the, the state of the uh, technology has advanced considerably. Now, one thing that is now a best practice that kind of takes a rainbow table out of play is this idea of salting a hash. Has anyone ever heard about salting a hash? Are we still together? Is somebody there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. So you have a password and then the password is hashed. And normally the hash function creates a hash that can be stored in the password database or security account management, right? And 
that's different for different operating systems. In Linux, it's stored differently. In Windows, it's got a very specific, it's very easy to look up, but essentially uh, in, in recent years, what they've done is enhance the technology for password storage by creating an additional component known as a salt, which is kind of goofy when you think about it. It's like hash is a food, you can put salt. It's very salty as well. There's a lot of salt in hash. There's a lot of sodium. Uh, so it's not a good thing for people to eat if you have a lot of high blood pressure. And I'm sorry to digress, but yeah, there's an irony there. Okay, so you add the salt. It's an extra cryptographic component and it's randomly generated based on a set of criteria. Now the random generation based on a set of criteria can be predictable. So salts can be defeated if the algorithm for the salt is known. For example, if I take my, if I take my computer and I take my system name and my system work group, and then I generate a salt with the combination of my system name and my system work group. Okay, everybody with me? So I take, I take the name and the work group and, and uh, what's the problem with that salt method as far as one of those pieces? Is one of those pieces known most of the time? on most systems? Hello? Anybody still with me? Can someone unmute? Yeah, I was still there. Okay, thank you. Just wanna be sure. All right, so this is just a quick example and it's not the best example, but, but the concept is uh, similar. You take a system component, you use a variable system component. If the system component isn't very variable, then of course it's not as strong. But the goal is to uh, create a salt that's used in combination with the hashing, the hashing algorithm. So the password is salted, then it's hashed. So it's a, it's a pre-hashing function. Your mileage may vary depending on the hash algorithm, right? And then, then you have something that's a lot harder to guess. Why am I telling you this? If you're trying to work digital forensics to gain access to a system and have to crack the password with permission, so this is ethical hacking, right? In order to do your forensics, um, you, you know, depending on the salt mechanism, you need to know how that is and what it, how it works, okay? Any questions about salts before we continue? So we did, we were talking about TPM and PKI. I just didn't, didn't take uh, much time to talk about salts. And I wanted to loop that in. I may add some very specific information just to mention salt in here. In fact, I'm going to make this revision 1D before I forget about it. Okay, and we'll go. We'll go ahead and uh, convert this to a PDF and make sure that uh, this version of the PDF is out in the mix for your um, reference. Did we relate that there is a handy reference on TPM in our last session? So there is a helpful reference on TPM generically. It's a Wikipedia article, but then each industry or each industry leader, Microsoft, the major hardware manufacturers, they also have their own TPM references and they have utilities to use with their TPM implementation. So uh, there is a series of solution providers, believe it or not, that 
um, will provide a useful resource. So if you have an organization, and this is a very important point, I want you to remember in, in your early consulting stages with new clients, if you have an organization and they have a mix of uh, systems and servers, because they're in particular, they're a BYOD, bring your own device organization, um, you want to recommend to the organization that they take a closer look at TPM challenges and in particular, a credible solution for TPM management so that uh, when you run into encryption problems, um, you have the resources to manage that effectively. And that's, that's, a, that's a stumbling block in some uh, digital forensic scenarios if you don't. Clearing the TPM. So oftentimes if you have IT staff that are poorly trained or you have digital forensic first responders and they're struggling and someone gets the bright idea, oh, I'll just clear the TPM, right? There's an option in the BIOS for you to clear the TPM. If you do, you lose the encryption keys. So again, in earlier versions of TPM, there were lots of challenges and lots of issues. Um, did we review the recovery agent aspect from our last session? I believe we did. Does that sound familiar? We stated that in, in a domain environment, the domain administrator account includes the recovery agent. Yes. This, this is enhanced when the server role for a certificate authority is included in the Active Directory environment. So this, this is a kind of a hand in glove recommendation. We talked about domain or enterprise environments and how uh, there are a lot of hurdles and barriers that are removed for digital forensic scenarios in a domain environment, a properly, implement, a properly implemented domain environment. And that's because the authority of the administrative accounts, enterprise administrator, domain administrator, um, they're automatically made a recovery agent. However, when you have additional infrastructure in an active directory environment like web servers, email servers, and there's digital uh, signatures and so on, it's really important for the chain of trust to be sound in order for you to draw authentic and valid digital forensic um, conclusions. Right. So if you have somebody who's signing their email, has anyone here ever used uh, signatures to sign an email? Has anyone here ever done that? Ever used like digital signature features? Yeah, uh, I think everyone needs to do it for FASA as well. Right, right. That's a great example. So yes, FAFSA include, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So FAFSA includes, a, it's been a while since I've done FAFSA. So, um, but that's, that's a great and relevant example for, um, yes, for what, what uh, students would encounter. The, the whole notion here is that you're going to use built-in features and those are much more seamless if you have a public key infrastructure implementation and in the active directory context that's known as the certificate authority now those certificates when you're talking about email systems and in particular web servers ssl Secure sockets layer was an older technology that has since been deprecated. The term deprecated is a formal um, word that means retired. So SSL, you'll see some implementations for older websites out in the wild. If you encounter them in a corporate environment or, or if your client is using SSL because it's old as dirt, 
somebody set it up 10 years ago, that kind of thing. Um, you do want to take great care to advise them how your forensic capacities are tied to um, current and updated implementations of technology, in particular TLS, right? So if you're trying to work some sleuthing and you want to find out, okay, what happened on this web server? What happened with this certificate? What happened with the digital signature, um, it's important to, to encourage your clients and explain to them that if they don't uh, update to TLS, right, then so they're, they're not only hurting themselves, but they're also, um, they're hurting your capacity to support them. Now, Yes or no, did we mention this new thing with Apple? I just want to make sure I've covered all the bases here. Did, did we see this screen in a previous session? Yeah, we did. Okay. So their, their encryption is so good. Okay. Um, so what happens? If the subject of a network forensic investigation is not cooperative, and what do you do? Well, that's the thing you have to have an action plan, especially with PYOD cases. What I'd like to do with the time remaining is walk through, if you haven't seen already, you need to walk through this taxonomy of forensic tools and methods. Now, this is not uh, this, this is a work in progress and it changes every year and there are tweaks, but this is something that I expect you to become very familiar with. It's only two pages, okay? It's only two pages. And what we've done is basically categorized each of the tools or method based on a forensic task or stage or phase of work, okay? So that's why you see baseline here. And I'm gonna see if I can zoom in. How's that, is that better? Yeah. No. Quick review of subject matter. So um, I'm gonna just check to make sure each of these links are still good. All right, so seven best computer forensic tools. So autopsy, you're gonna be seeing a lot about this. Much of these are suites of tools. So when we talk about uh, tools in particular and, and, a, and a name like FTK is mentioned, it's not one tool, it is an entire uh, collection of, of uh, tools to use. And autopsy is, is very familiar. You'll have a chance to work with autopsy later in the course. Um, for your, I'm considering checking to see if there is a vendor like NCASE, well, they stopped doing this a while ago, but FTK was good. You could get a free uh, trial version of FTK that was good for a certain amount of time. And so, uh, and depending on the version, you could do more or less and it, it would, you'd have access to some of its features, but not all of its features. FTK was originally open source. This is one thing that you see over and over and over again is that open source tools eventually become commercial interests and FTK is a great example of that. FTK, for, and that stands for Forensic Toolkit. The Forensic Toolkit um, was, it was a free product and so they've kept a piece of it free. Um, however, depending on the scenario, some of these features can engage or not engage. So when we talk about uh, analyzing a drive that isn't live, we're talking about analyzing a drive image that's been captured, okay? So some of the 
tool suites that you encounter have the same live capacity as I mentioned with an end case. So if you in an organization with lots of money, the last time I checked uh, a site with 2000 employees had a annual license renewal for end case and it cost $10 million. It was a $10 million annual renewal they had to pay, but they had 2000 employees and each of those employees, regardless of what system they were on, there was an end case active icon in there so they could capture live data in RAM or in drive uh, swap files, really elegant stuff, but very expensive. And you would have to get specialty training and additional certification on that platform. So this is kind of like getting a Microsoft certification. You'd have to you'd have to study and then sit for an exam and there's quite a bit of expense and so on uh, going for it. You'll notice here in this link that it talks about memory forensics and volatility, right? So you're going to have uh, special case tools that apply in one situation and not in others. So I want you to take the time to make sure that you uh, check each of these links and I'll see if there's something newer out there that's credible, but um, so this was, this was uh, released January of 2021. There might be something um, a little more current, but you'll find that things change from year to year. I had an entire series of solutions that were developed around the FTK toolkit, and then they changed their availability and they said, oh, you only have it for 30 days. And we had to discontinue use of it, which made me very sad. SANS, if you're familiar with SANS, has anyone ever heard of SANS before? Uh -huh. SANS has a, a forensic tool suite they call Slingshot. And that's actually a really cool thing to download. If you enroll for a free membership with sans.edu, uh, you have access to that kind of thing. And um, let's see here. SANS is also a source for advanced. They are now accredited as an institution of higher learning and they have graduate programs. Their master's program, their advanced degrees, I don't think they have a PhD yet, but their master's degree are very, uh, very rigorous and, and highly valued everywhere in the world. I'm going to go ahead and download a copy of this and see if we have a version of it. So this is this is a great white paper, and I would encourage you to also review this in addition to the matrix that, you know, the, the taxonomy that we have here. Um, and I may post this in the references section in a folder called additional references, or just post it underneath the addendum. Um, one of the things that is really important to use as a forensic resource generically is the MITRE attack matrix. When you have an attacker who is trying to exploit your exposures, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, that's what TTTP stands for, uh, is kind of a fingerprint for each attacker uh, especially well-known advanced persistent threats. So APT or advanced persistent threats, those are live human beings. And the methods they use, the tactics, techniques, and procedures is their operational fingerprint in, in a manner of speaking. Um, you can find information about that from the CISA, the Computer Information Security Agency, they have resources there. MITRE is a company that happens to run, I think, currently they run a portion of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. So they're a for-profit corporation, or, or maybe, they, maybe they have nonprofit uh, 
subdivisions. I don't know, but they they were they were commissioned under the U.S. federal government to create uh, a resource of exposures and exploits and uh, additional information, and it is a it's an amazing resource as a forensic tool. When you think back to module one, when we had, we had um, in module one, we talked about equipping a lab. And in the lab, you had a disconnected or air gapped forensic workstation, but then you had one that was connected to the internet. Uh, the one that you would connect to the internet would probably have this on its favorites list, right? So you would um, download and access these resources, and then you could search for a given set of symptoms, a, a different set of criteria or attributes, and then, and then work from there and narrow things down. And then as you're conducting deep analysis on an exploit, you get a chance to uh, understand the tools of malicious actors, lateral movement, how they leverage, how they leverage access to an exposed system and move uh, to adjacent systems on a network. So when we're talking about lateral movement, that's one of the tactics, techniques, and procedures. Please remember that 90% of exploits that occur happen through web mediated or message mediated um, platforms, right? Any questions about the MITRE attack matrix? So what you'll see here are, um, so baseline, you can use NCASE um, to collect a series of data on a system and that becomes a baseline. You can use a variety of tools. The most favored tool that's been there a long time is something called Tripwire. Tripwire automatically creates hashes of every file on the system. So if you talk about a hashing tool on steroids, Tripwire will generate hashes for every file and every directory on a system. And then when any file changes, it will alert you. So it's an automated notification system for file changes, right? Well, when you think about it, a lot of files on your system change every time what happens each month. Anyone? Hello? What, what's a monthly event if you're a Windows user or a Mac user? Updates. Updates, yeah. Yeah, updates can be very large. A cumulative update, right? So that can be a challenging, that can be a challenging thing. So where would you use Tripwire? Where you have uh, relatively static or air-gapped machines that perform a special uh, purpose. And so you'd wanna do that. Um, SCCM, System Configuration Centralized Management. I think that's what the acronym stands for. That is a system automated tool and incorporated into SCCM is a wide range of really powerful tools to automatically configure systems and then enforce configurations. So one of the things that's true in a corporate environment is the capacity to enforce a configuration through the use of group policy objects. If you are operating in a domain context, uh, let's see here. Can everyone still see my screen? Yep. 
Okay. Oh, wait a second. I was typing sideways here. Uh. Whoa, wait a second. Woo. Scared my mule. All right. In a domain environment, you have the ability to enforce configurations through the use of what are known as group policy objects. So you can define the configuration and enforce the configuration and there are ways in a centralized environment to push, right? And, and the, the word, the, the important operative word here is enforce a given configuration. And those make for useful, useful baselines. You can detect through SCCM. So when you're, when you're working with integrated systems like this, you can detect changes from the baseline. And, and there are, you can actually set up, and this has to do with uh, having confidence with the integrity of machines. You can have like quarantine areas on your network you can set up, especially in a BYOD environment if a security profile minimum requirement isn't met. Those things can be detected. Um, of course, SCCM is not a BYOD environment. So that's one thing I would point out. You have other tools that work like SCCM. An important aspect of baseline is also logs. So there's a certain amount of activity, log activity, right? That is part of the scenario. SCCM incorporates the use of what's known as a seam. Has anyone ever heard of the term SIEM, S-I-E-M? SIEM? Yes, no, maybe? Should we take a short break and come back in a minute? Are people still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, still here. Right, a seam. Stands for security information and event management. And Microsoft has a handy little page that says, oh, what is a seam? And then when you click in there, it's not long before, what are you looking at? Oh, they're handy dandy SCCM. So, SIEM components are embedded into the system configuration and um, SCCM. Let me make sure I have that acronym completely correct. Configuration manager. System center configuration manager. Okay, so the word config was in there. System Center Configuration Manager. It's been a minute since I've looked at this, uh, but it is a very powerful tool. And the important thing is to understand here with the start of this matrix or, or taxonomy is that you have corporate tools that establish an environment baseline. So one of the 
finer points of baseline forensics is that you not only have device baselines and system baselines like the one you captured in the module one solution, but you also have baselines for the entire environment. And this, this includes um, a certain amount of network activity that's logged for a given day. And so you can see uh, radical changes in the, you know, you'll see an uptick in outstream, upstream traffic, right? Outbound traffic. And that would be a trigger for a baseline detection where you know something is off. Another thing you want to see that's a part of the baseline for your uh, operating environment are, and I know this isn't, this doesn't seem like a tool. So this is really important to understand, but uh, for, a, for an environment baseline, you want users and systems to include these pop-ups when people are logging in and accessing you. You want banners, you want login banners, and you want all of your users in the environment to have reviewed and uh, accept the terms and conditions of an acceptable use policy. Now, op operationally, this is more of a policy resource and a policy tool, but the reason it's relevant and it's important as a part of baseline methods is because Let's pretend that an, part of the acceptable use policy is that no user on a company system is allowed to change the auditing method or to turn off the logs, okay? Um, I need to give you a quick example of how to create some real serious trouble here. Yeah. Yeah. Can everyone see the event viewer? Yeah, we can. Yep. Okay. So let's pretend that you're in a corporate environment and um, you have an educated user who is mischievous and they want to cover their tracks. This is one thing that, that is part of the forensic method it's your knowledge, skills, and abilities of attack methods. Uh, there's something called an attack chain, and there's a five-step process where systems and resources are exploited. And if we didn't cover that in the last module, we're gonna be getting to it soon. But if you configure the properties of a system log, I can set the system log so it's, what's the size? How is it measured? Kilobytes. Kilobytes. So like, what would happen if I did something like this? And I hit apply. What, what would happen to the, the effective history of this system log? With this setting right here. A lot of it will be gone. Yes, it would constantly be refreshed. In any given moment, there are things that happen. If I refresh this in just a moment, you'll notice right here, it's the 14. Oh, by the way, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. So it wouldn't take long if, if happy there was... Valentine's. Say again? What happy Valentine's Day. Yes, happy Valentine's Day. So you could have a policy that says you can't, and it's an institutional policy, it's an acceptable user policy, and it says no user in our system you know, is authorized to what? Clear the logs, modify log settings. You can change settings, right? Do not, over, do not overwrite events. If somebody changes this setting, the system will crash. So a good way to crash a system is to set the, oh, I shouldn't say this. Or maybe I should say this. Let's see if we can spice things up a bit, eh? I'm gonna change the maximum log size to like 16 kilobytes. Then I'm gonna set this that says do not overwrite events, 
right? And then I'm gonna hit apply. What happens to my computer when I get to the magical 16 kilobyte limit? Anyone? It no dies. Clue. It locks it crashes. up. It crashes. It halts. The system halts. It's unusable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might be called to a situation where you're like, we don't know what happened to this thing. It, I mean, it works fine for five minutes and then there's this strange error. Uh, there's a strange message on the screen. We don't know what the hell it means. You. You have to you have to clear the log manually by saving a backup copy of it or hitting this button to clear the log before the system will resume function. This is one of the internal security measures embedded in the kernel of many operating systems. And that class of operating systems is called a journaled operating system. A journaled operating system is hardwired to, to log and audit a variety of processes, services, uh, system configuration changes, and so on, right? And by design, they're built in to uh, make sure that there are safeties in place. If this one is the default, right? Overwrite as events are needed, oldest, oldest events first, and the log size is set to 16, all you have to do is create some create some random you could have a script that runs every two or three minutes uh, does everybody know what a cron script is does everybody know everyone know what a linux terminal is linux linux terminal yeah linux yep. terminal right okay so there's uh there is a command there's a resource a program in linux systems called cron Cron meaning C-R-O-N as in chronograph or has to do with timekeeping. You can run an automated script to generate some system activity uh, on intervals and basically it'll fill the log and then overwrite the log. It'll wash the log. So basically it's like an automatic timer to wash the log. And the point I'm trying to make here is your acceptable use policies have to be understood on the front side as a part of the baseline, because what are you doing? You're investigating the systems you must analyze. And if there are practices and policies saying users can, users can't, and you encounter something like this, you encounter a problem like this, you know automatically, oh, this is off the baseline. This isn't a part of what's expected. The users are not supposed to modify the settings of the security log. You're not supposed to change the settings of the security log so that log on events are specific log on events are not excluded from being logged, right? So as soon as you understand that a configuration has changed and you also understand the acceptable use policy, those two go hand in hand. You have enforced configurations, but when you have a departure from the enforced configuration, you know what's going on, right? Does, does everybody understand what I'm getting at here? A lot of this has to do with what? EAT. The patterns I want you to pick out of this taxonomy, you see some repeating words here, right? Prior authorization, there's setup that has to be done in advance or you have to purchase something, there are criteria, right? Prerequisites. In almost every single case, prior authorization and education awareness and training are a part of the prerequisites for effective use. So what does that mean? If you look at this taxonomy and you look at the pattern down the prerequisite column, one of the things you should quickly conclude is if you're walking into a, a forensic scenario cold and you just want to pull out your handy dandy forensic toolkit, you might be in for some challenges because in order for those to be used effectively and properly, 
there are some requirements that should have been taken care of up front under ideal circumstances. And a lot of times when you get a chance to serve a client the first time, it's not under ideal circumstances. So why do I have this taxonomy and why should you keep this as a reference if you're going to work in forensics? Because you want to share this with your clients and say, look, um, I made mention that there are some conditions and stages we should set in order for, you know, forensics to be, the, the value of forensics to, to work in an, and, and to be enhanced and to be able to maximize the benefit of it. These are things that we want in there. If you have a customer that basically says, yeah, I, I, I don't wanna do that. One of two things is possible. They're either part of the problem or they're so cheap, they don't wanna spend a little time and money to make sure it's done right. In which case you should cling to this, <laughs> cling to this as a guide as a guideline, it's kind of a tipping point, right? It's kind of like a tripwire. That's the, that's the occasion where you thank someone for their time and you scratch them off your prospective client list. Because if they aren't willing to do the things that's required, something is up. They're either part of the problem and they're in the mix with the illicit activity and they don't want their illicit activity discovered, right? And then who's gonna be the scapegoat? Oh, they're gonna turn it into a mess. We're on the edge of our class period. I did wanna take a moment to talk about Wireshark. So I did wanna talk about some network uh, forensics and I wanted to show you something in a, where are we here? We may have mentioned this in previous classes. Can everyone see my Kali Linux machine? Yep. Can everyone see my network port? Yeah, we can. If I'm operating with my Kali in this mode, the packets that are flowing to and from Kali are actually natted in, into and through my network interface on the physical host, my laptop. What am I saying? The network activity that's happening is like strained or filtered through, in a manner of speaking, it's processed, it's translated through my host network adapter. I would wanna work in bridged mode. And I would also want to take promiscuous mode and allow all in promiscuous mode. Now here is something that I would want to be sure I make note of with my IT staff. This is where you lean in closely because you want to catch this. If you have a physical Kali machine or you have a virtual Kali machine, Regardless, you're going to want to make note of the MAC address for the interface you're using for Wireshark. And you're going to want to register your MAC address on or with the IT department. And in particular with the network administrator. That's because when you get into promiscuous mode, when you're conducting network uh, forensics, you're going to be generating an awful lot of activity on that network, and it's going to start alarming a lot of different protocols and, and uh, management systems. You want them to understand, you know, this is you, so that they don't, um, well, they don't freak out, they don't do something that they shouldn't do that's bad for you and bad for them, okay? Everybody get that? The other thing that you want to do on the other side, so this is the other piece of it. In order for network forensics to work properly, one of the prerequisites is that you have to include what's called a span port. 
Have we ever discussed a span port before? Also known as a mirrored port. It involves configuration of a switch, okay? Sometimes it's referred as a span, meaning the network activity in that one port spans all of the other ports on the switch. Okay, so if you have a spanned port, what you're doing, this is probably a, a, a good image here, if you create a span port, you're designating a specific set of a port or ports, the activity on all the other ports, the activity on all the other ports is mirrored or copied. So all of the send and receive traffic on all the ports is flowing into the single port, right? Now this poses challenges and it, it requires pre-configuration, but if it's done properly, the important thing to remember is that if you have 24 gigabits of ports here and your span port is also only one gigabit, do you think the span port or mirror port has the physical capacity to accommodate full traffic from all 24 ports? Yes or no? Hello, should I repeat the question? Yes, please. Let's pretend that you have a switch like this and let's pretend you have 24 ports that are a gigabit each and they're all connected to gigabit clients and they're all very heavy users of the network. Everybody with me on that? Yeah. Yep. And then let's say that you set up a mirrored port or a span port to receive a copy of all of the send and receive traffic on all 24 ports. And the span port is only one gigabit large. And you're trying to capture the traffic from 24 other ports. Do you think that is physically possible? It's not a trick question. No, it's not possible. If you have a 10 gallon hat and you have to pour a hundred gallons into it, how many gallons are you gonna fit in the 10 gallon hat? 10. 10 gallons, right? So what is it that has to be pre-configured in order for Wireshark to work properly? You have to turn on promiscuous mode on the device that has the Wireshark running in the first place. It must be connected to what's called a span or mirrored port and the physical capacity of the spanner, the mirrored port needs to be many times larger than the uh, sum of all the traffic on all those other ports. So typically you might have what's called a GBIX module. You'll have an SFP module. Well, GBIX is an older term, that's what older switches, but SFP, you'll have an SFP module and you'll have a 10 gigabit ethernet connection or a fiber connection and you'll have an, a specialized adapter, right? Because you have to you have to work a lot of bandwidth there. That's an important aspect of Wireshark computing, and making sure that you allow your handy dandy friendly IT staff know, hey, I'm doing Wireshark over here, and you're going to see a lot of stuff with this with this particular MAC address uh, on it. That concludes what we expected to cover today in our session. Given the information we've just presented, can you think of any questions or comments or curiosities you'd like to share before we close? Okay.